Thank you so much for the uh, very kind intro. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very excited to uh, talk to you for the next few minutes about um, essentially what has been uh, one of the main uh, drives during my PhD, which has been the question of how do we keep autonomous systems, in particular robotic systems, uh, including drones, self-driving cars, home robots, um, and even more generally, AI and automation systems uh, safe? How do we keep these systems safe? And especially, how do we keep them safe in a world that is increasingly uh, complex, where we're deploying these systems, where they have to interact with humans, um, and what does it even mean to have uh, safety assurances for these systems, given that there's so much uncertainty going on in the world? Um, and how should this inform our design of robotics? So I'm going to be um, giving you only some uh, partial answers, which is uh, the best I could get uh, during my PhD, and also primarily leaving you with some open questions. So my goal at the end of this talk is that you'll be quite uh, dissatisfied and hopefully a little intrigued to keep looking into these questions yourselves. So, um, as uh, all of you know, uh, robotic systems have really been uh, gaining uh, applications in the last few years, and there's a lot of excitement about uh, self-driving cars, uh, drones for a variety of applications, including uh, transportation of goods. Um, there's actually robotic systems that are being deployed for delivery right now on the Berkeley campus. I don't know if you have these here at Stanford. Uh, they're kind of ridiculous, but they sort of get from A to B. Uh, it's unclear how autonomous they actually are, and people sometimes have fun kicking them around, which is an interesting human-robot interaction problem. Uh, but also, you know, applications like manufacturing and surgery. And um, the truth is that this opens a lot of very exciting opportunities, which is why we want to be able to deploy these systems. But at the same time, um, we have a number of important challenges. And one of the most important is how do we keep these systems safe? Because traditionally, when we think about robotic systems as they have existed uh, over the last few decades, this is how we've gone about safety. We just um, keep the robot in a cage, separate it from humans, and we slap a threatening sticker on it, making sure that nobody gets near it, or else this is what will happen to you. Um, uh, but you know, as we explore the possibilities of robotics and we start deploying them on more open environments where there is more complexity and more uncertainty, it really becomes very difficult to guarantee uh, that these systems will be able to, uh, to actually stay safe. Um, this is a video from uh, the year that I spent in industry before starting my PhD. And as you can see, we were going uh, about safety with a rather rudimentary method. It kind of worked pretty effectively. We wanted to make sure that the drone wasn't going to fly into the neighbor's house. Um, and it did the trick, but obviously it wasn't a very principled method. So when I started at Berkeley, we started um, you know, exploring exciting applications uh, also with drones. And so we had this system that was able to fly uh, following some safety algorithms. But every now and then, we had something like this happen, which was quite, quite, um, quite terrible. If you're a grad student and this happens to you, you know that the next couple of weeks are not going to be a lot of fun. Um, and really what we are, you know, at this point, we were really asking, okay, what can we do to make sure that we can run experiments, for example, running uh, reinforcement learning algorithms on our drones without the risk of these things happening? Um, and so we, you know, went back to the drawing board. My first proposal was that we used ropes, but that didn't really fly. So we went back to the drawing board and we came up with some theoretical safety guarantees that made sure that whenever the drone came into a situation where it was theoretically predicted that it could hit the ground or hit the ceiling, we would actually override it uh, in a provably safe manner. Now, the problem with provably safe guarantees, and we're going to be talking uh, a lot about this uh, in the next few minutes, is that they're, they're only going to work for as long as the reality that you're dealing with has to do with the model that you're using for it. So we uh, decided to put this to a test by turning on a big fan and starting blowing air sideways at the quad rotor. And what you can see here is that when the system comes back down, and flies into this airstream that is not part of the theoretical model that we base the guarantees on, things actually start to go uh, a little bit wrong. And eventually, the system is taken so far away from the operating conditions that it was assuming that, as you can see, the safety guarantees no longer apply and it actually hits the ground. Um, and this, is, uh, this was only more true when we started trying to fly drones around humans. So here we have a little drone, and it's supposed to be navigating around uh, human pedestrians. Here we have our canonical human being, uh, Sylvia, uh, who is also a grad student at Berkeley. Um, and so what we found was that whenever the human moved in a way that was 
roughly following the predictions made by the system, then everything went fine. But when the human did something unexpected, like in this case going around this coffee spill that we uh, drew on the floor, the drone gets confused, doesn't know what it's doing, eventually crashes into Sylvia, and of course you can see how upset she is. So at the end of the day, what we get from this is that Sure, we can, we can compute theoretical guarantees, and this is a good starting point when we try to give assurances for safety for our systems, but ultimately, any guarantee that we're able to compute and to reason about is only as good as a theoretical model that it is based on. And ultimately, modeling error is something that is inevitable uh, whenever you're dealing with a sufficiently complicated system, ultimately a sufficiently interesting system that you'd like to do anything with it. And mind you, this is not only a problem that we're having in a university lab. If you look at what's happening these days with the prototypes that are being deployed uh, of self-driving cars, uh, this issue of uh, modeling error is a central problem in trying to give safety assurances. So in these two examples, you basically have two cases where the Uber car and the Google car at the time uh, were both unable to predict where the human was going to be and what the human was going to do at a given point in time. Uh, in the case on the left, a uh, human driver made a left turn. The uh, robot wasn't even expecting there to be a human there, but there, there they were. And in the case on the right, there was a bus driver who thought it was their turn to go, and the car thought that it was its turn to go, and they ended up in the same place at the same time. So really, um, this notion of uh, correctly reasoning about uh, the world and acknowledging that your models can sometimes be flawed is really important when it comes to giving safety guarantees. Now. This is important, and in, far, and in fact, it's something that is worrying more and more people uh, as we're starting to see these AI and robotics technologies get deployed and developed. And if you look at declarations made, you know, statements made in the last year or two uh, by different governments, you see things like human beings will only be able to uh, confidently and fully reap the benefits of AI systems uh, if they can really trust the technology, which was stated by the European Commission. Um, a couple of years earlier, uh, the United States White House um, stated that public safety must be protected as these technologies are uh, tested and begin to mature. And only last year, the uh, Deputy Secretary General of the Chinese Academy of Sciences said that to truly harvest the benefits of AI, we must first ensure it's secure, controllable, and reliable deployment so, or development. And if you look really at the common factors here, you can see that trust, safety, controllability, security, reliability are quite pervasive in uh, uh, you know, even government's concerns about AI. So what I'll try to convince you about uh, in the next few minutes is that if we want to deploy high stakes automated systems, whether these are robotic systems or more general AI systems, even you know, going as far as your uh, Facebook uh, ad optimizer, um, these systems really should be able to reason about what kinds of guarantees and assurances they can give and how reliable these guarantees are in light of the actual evidence that they're getting from the world. So how much should I trust my guarantees given that the world is not identical to um, my model. And so this is really a crucial distinction that I think we really need to make when thinking about safety assurance. It is one thing to give a guarantee, which is ultimately a mathematical, a formal statement about an abstraction of the world, which is a model, and it's not identical to the world, and giving an assurance uh, understood here as a high confidence statement about the real system, which is not the same thing as the model. And this can be based on model guarantees, you can have a model, you can make some statements about the model, but then you really need to breach, uh, and, you, and you need to, you need to uh, not breach, you need to bridge this reality gap between the model and the real system. And so there's ways in which we can do this, uh, and I will be talking about them uh, today. I'm going to be talking first briefly about uh, what it means to give guarantees about a model of the system. So I'll be talking a little bit about safety analysis. And then uh, three different uh, ways in which we can actually try to give guarantees. All right, so let's start with safety verification, um, which is uh, how to give theoretical guarantees on the safe, oper safe operation of a system model. And here by safe, we mean that we want, want to make sure that we can avoid a certain set of forbidden failure states. What is a failure state? It can be anything from an actual physical collision uh, to the robot violating some rule that we've specified for it. For example, we might decide that it's uh, already a safety violation for a self-driving car to be driving in the wrong uh, direction um, on the road. So the way we formalize this is through dynamical systems theory. So we think of the state of the system, which can be 
uh, the robot, but also other variables in the world, like for example, the positions of other vehicles or other agents. And we reason about the evolution of this state with some differential equation. Uh, and what we say is the evolution of the state can be affected, can depend on the state itself, what is already going on, but also on some decisions that we make, the control input, and possibly on some other external variables that we don't control. And this disturbance term can capture anything from the actual actions of other agents in the environment to, in fact, any form of modeling error. So if we're not sure about what really is going to happen, we can capture this disturbance, uh, we can capture this uncertainty about some dis uh, with the form, in the form of some disturbance input that can really affect the evolution of the dynamics. So under those conditions, we can specify a set of forbidden or failure states and reason about whether the trajectory of the system as it evolves over time will uh, at all times stay clear of these obstacles. Now, unfortunately, what this trajectory does, or in some cases fortunately, will depend on the decisions that we make over time. Therefore, we're not really just asking, will the system always be safe, but rather, is there something that we can do with our control input to keep the system safe uh, at all times? Here, in general, throughout the talk, I'm going to be using bold face to refer to trajectories or signals over time and regular font to mean the instantaneous value of a certain control, uh, control action or state over time. One way in which we, uh, we can capture whether or not the system is violating the constraints is by using some form of metric. For example, some distance, some sign distance that is positive when you're outside of the failure states uh, and negative when you're inside. And it'll be all the more negative, the more uh, deeply you violate the constraints, all the more positive, the more margin you have. And so we can reason for these two trajectories about the evolution of this uh, distance over time, or this margin. Uh, and the first thing to notice is that taking an average of this uh, margin or any sort of sum is actually inadequate. If you look at the integral of these two curves, in both cases the integral is positive. However, in one of the cases the system is really violating the constraints. This is an important point to make because a lot of the optimal control uh, formulations that are out there, including reinforcement learning, tend to reason about the sum of rewards over time, which is really inadequate to capture something like the worst case, the minimum reached by the function over time, which is really what we care about when we ask questions about safety. So um, instead, we'd like to reason about the minimum of L reached over time, and this is often called a reachability problem, where ultimately what we have is the minimum or the infimum of the signal over time. Um, and long story short, we can reason about uh, this and we can uh, obtain it through dynamic programming, for example, propagating things backward in time, making the optimal decision at every instant in time. I'm not going to get into all the technical details of this, but this is generally stuff that you can find. Also, feel free to stick around at the end and ask me for references. Uh, but if we do this for the top trajectory, we see that this is okay. It's a safe trajectory because the minimum over time is positive. If we propagate in a similar way, through the second trajectory, we see that at some point it becomes negative. We keep this minimum value as we propagate the, uh, the value function to the present. And we see that this is an unsafe trajectory because we will eventually hit the, the uh, unsafe, or oh, sorry, the failure states. OK, so that's a trajectory that we don't want. The way this actually works when we go from individual trajectories to the full analysis over the state space is um, what's called Hamilton-Jacobi safety analysis, and we can visualize it here. Suppose this is our uh, much smaller failure set. We're going to uh, now look at it kind of in 3D, and we're going to have the initial distance function, which is a cone in this case. We're using Euclidean distance to the failure disk. And then we can propagate the dynamics of the system backward in time, making the optimal decisions, and also considering the worst case uh, of the disturbance, so that we're protecting not only about some nominal model, but uh, against all possible realizations of our uncertainty. And when you end up with this propagation, you can see that the value function has sort of uh, leafed out of the original cone, and now we're left with this uh, boundary, which is what separates safe states from unsafe states. And so we have this important notion of the safe set, which is a set of states from which the controller can take some action that will keep the system from entering the cone, uh, sorry, from entering, in this case, the disk for all time. If you're here, if you're inside, you already have a negative value, which means that even under your best effort, there might be a realization of the system that will actually drag you into the cone. So this, uh, this uh, safety analysis is actually very useful because it allows us to obtain really the mathematically best effort 
that we could possibly make to keep the system safe, which means that it can often reveal some non-intuitive strategies to keep safety uh, that might not be directly uh, achievable by just having some engineers sit down and hard code them into the system. Um, so whenever we can compute these solutions, it's actually extremely helpful. And an example of this was a project that we did with NASA a few years ago, where they wanted to be able to have essentially an air traffic management system that would scale better than uh, just having human air traffic controllers, um, so that we could have in the order of hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of vehicles flying in the same airspace, for example, over the San Francisco Bay Area at the same time. And the way we went about this was to break down the system into um, sequential planning for all the trajectories, because in fact, NASA was going to have a first come, first served system. So what they wanted to do was have the first vehicle obtain a safe trajectory, then the, same traje the second vehicle come in, request a trajectory, uh, and obtain something that would be safe without perturbing the trajectory already given to the first vehicle, and so on and so forth. So uh, what we were able to do was we actually developed some new theoretical tools for time varying safety analysis. And ultimately what this did was we first uh, took the first vehicle, which was the highest priority vehicle, and we gave it a trajectory. Uh, by computing the safety analysis. Here we see the safely reachable set that we were talking about earlier. And then the first vehicle becomes a moving obstacle for the second vehicle. And you see that it cuts into the backward time propagation of the second vehicle safe set. And the same thing happens here for the first two vehicles becoming obstacles for the third and the first three vehicles becoming obstacles for the fourth. So when you run the safety computations, the advantage is that you can actually run each one in the state space of a single vehicle so that you don't get this combinatorial blow up that you would normally get if you tried to do uh, all of the vehicles at the same time. And it turns out that this scales linearly with the number of vehicles because each time you're only doing a computation in the space of that single vehicle. Um, and also it gives you strict safety guarantees as long as things are according to the model. Um, and it also gives you uh, the optimal trajectories for these vehicles in, in the sense of being the shortest, the quickest trajectories to get from A to B, subject to the priority ordering, uh, which is uh, what NASA is giving us. So this is for four vehicles, but uh, you don't have to take my word for it that it works. Here it is in a simulation with uh, 50 uh, vehicles flying over San Francisco. We have another one with 200 vehicles over the Bay Area, but I think it's actually less interesting. What you can actually see here is vehicles flying with different wind conditions and different timing conditions. Um, and you see that all of them are actually able to compute their trajectories and, uh, and complete them without coming into collisions with one another. Uh, with one another. Uh, the wind speed is important because while we are taking this as a theoretical safety guarantee, in fact, this is something that will apply as long as uh, your error, the error between the model and the real system, is bounded by uh, a difference in your, in your evolution of the, of the uh, position of the vehicle that can be uh, interpreted as wind speed of up to 11 meters per second. So this doesn't necessarily mean it has to be exactly wind speed. It could also be other things like gusts. It could be capturing uh, the delay in your system when it tries to make a turn, but it actually takes a while. As long as it can be captured under uh, virtual wind speed of 11 meters per second, the guarantee actually applies to the physical system. Um, and so this is a nice segue into the next uh, part of the talk, which is, OK, so we have this theoretical guarantee. How do, we sh how do we make sure that it actually applies to the physical system? Or to what extent can we make sure that it applies to the physical system? You can argue that, in fact, there is no way to make 100% sure, because fundamentally, a model and reality are two different things. The model is a mathematical object, and then reality is something made of atoms uh, about which we can't really write uh, theoretical statements. We can make an abstraction of the reality and then make theoretical statements about that. But reality is not, it's a type error, right? You can't have a theoretical guarantee about the physical world. All right, but we can do things. So one of the uh, first things that we wanted to do was see if we could apply some learning-based methods to, um, to uh, our robotic systems. And this is something that is becoming more and more attractive because uh, Learning-based methods like reinforcement learning, you can see a couple of examples over here, are becoming um, are being proven to be very powerful at planning over long horizons with complex dynamics, multi-agent systems. Uh, this is AlphaStar that was uh, uh, released by DeepMind, or at least published by DeepMind uh, very recently. Um, 
And uh, ultimately, what all of these reinforcement learning methods are doing is they are finding and so inferring some structure about the dynamics of the system, and then computing good first effort approximations to the solution of an optimal control problem. Here you see uh, a humanoid, which is a high dimensional dynamical system, and it's actually performing fairly well uh, you know, over irregular terrain, jumping around, and it's doing pretty well given that um, it's not explicitly using a model of the world. However, the problem with these systems is that they're good at average performance, but sometimes they have pretty, pretty terrible worst case performance. And it's very difficult to come up with any sort of guarantees as to when something like that is going to happen. And so the thing that we wanted uh, to do is sort of uh, uh, get over this, this, uh, this limitation and apply uh, these uh, kinds of techniques to systems that can break and cause damage, like robotic systems. So um, here we have the issue that we were talking about earlier, which is if we only uh, reason and optimize average performance, we're not really capturing worst case uh, worst case outcomes. So how do we go and apply these kinds of systems, uh, or these kinds of techniques, sorry, to robotic systems where a worst case outcome can actually be quite costly? Well, we can actually use the safety analysis uh, and the structure that comes out of the safety analysis to provide some very nice uh, properties around the learning system. So it turns out that you can use the safety analysis to provide what's called a safety envelope uh, that, will, that will basically treat the safe set as a safety bubble within which you can do whatever you want. And then when you reach the boundary of the safety bubble, you'll need to take the safety action to stay inside of it. So here's how it works. Here we have our uh, robotic system. That's the ceiling, the floor. And I'm plotting uh, vertical position on the vertical axis and then velocity on the horizontal axis. So basically, the more to the left you are, the faster you're moving down. The more to the right you are, the faster you're moving up. And so in this uh, picture with this relatively simple dynamics model where you are controlling the acceleration uh, with your rotor thrust, you can actually compute these sort of parabolic uh, curves that tell you that you're unsafe if you're near the ceiling and moving up very fast, and also if you're near the floor and moving down very fast, and you're safe if you're somewhere in the middle. Well, the nice hearing that we have, as I was uh, saying informally, is that if you start in any state inside of the safe set, then you actually have a controlled invariant set. When you get to the boundary, you apply the safe action. You do whatever you want on the inside. You get to the boundary again, and you apply the safe action. And that is guaranteed to push you back in as long as the amount of model error that you have is contained by some initial worst case bound that you had pre-computed or pre-estimated. So the way this works in practice uh, is we have, for example, the autonomous squad rotor here flying with some Vicon system. Uh, and we're going to try to do some simple reinforcement learning algorithm. But here, the catch is that we're going to initialize all the feature weights to zero. So what happens here is that we're going to start with a really, really bad guess as to how to fly the quad rotor. Now, normally, if we just let the quad rotor fly under these conditions, what it's going to do is it's going to crash into the ground. Fortunately, this is not what happens because we have the quad rotor inside of the safety envelope. So whenever the learning algorithm tries to crash the quad rotor, the safety override says, no, you don't and takes over. And so for, first, for the first few seconds, uh, you can see that the learning algorithm doesn't have very good ideas. But after about 30 seconds or so, it starts figuring out what it needs to do to fly. And it ends up flying up and down following this uh, trajectory reference that we were giving it. So here, the remarkable thing is not that we're beating performance in learning system or anything like that, but rather that we're able to do this with a system, um, with a learning algorithm that initially had a really, really poor idea of what to do. And still, we never crashed. We never uh, ended up uh, having to end the experiment because the quadcopter broke. Now, um, of course, the limitation here is what happens when you add the fan, what happens when your model guarantees are actually not accurate anymore. And so we are really back to this picture of the mind, of, of the, mind the gap. Uh, we have some guarantees based on Newton's second law and first principles models. We have the safety envelope protection, but we're not really accounting for, for example, strong wind, coupling between the vertical and the lateral dynamics or any other form of external perturbations that we, that we just forgot to model, right? Like, for example, the ground effect. So the way we, or one way in which we can get around this is it turns out that the structure of safety analysis gives us much more than just this one layer of protection. In fact, it turns out that we can replace the 0 here by any alpha greater than 0. And it turns out that the safety policy renders any level set 
of the value function that is above zero, so any of these nested sets, controlled invariant. Which means that rather than just a safe set or a safety bubble, what we have can be thought of as a safety onion. So what we can do is we can use safety analysis to um, uh, compute uh, the value function and therefore all of the layers of this onion and then use the data that we obtain as we are exploring the world to gauge how much we should trust the system and at what point we're at a, uh, at a point where it might be that outer layers of the onion won't actually be trustworthy because the model might be wrong at the outer layers. As long as the model is right at a single layer, we can use that layer to protect ourselves. And so basically, this is uh, the approach that we follow. I won't get into the details of how we reason about uh, you know, when the model is right or wrong. There's a variety of models that you can use for that. You can use a Gaussian process. You can use some other form of anomaly detection. But what matters here is that when the quad rotor comes down, this is the same video that you saw before, but kind of zoomed out. Um, it actually realizes uh, that the model is actually not trustworthy. So you're going to see two possible futures. The, the one that's uh, ghosted is the one that you saw initially, where the system is blindly trusting its model-based guarantees. The second one, you can see that very quickly it realized that its model was not trustworthy. So it's saying, I'm not going to use these layers of the onion because I don't trust them. I'm going to stay at this height, and I won't go down until and unless I start getting new data that tells me that it's actually safe to fly in that region, or at least that my model is sufficiently accurate in that region that I can trust my safety analysis. Um, and so let me just stay for time. OK, very good. Um, and so the reason that this is interesting uh, and that I think it's a good technique to have in general is that it doesn't matter how good our models are. At the end of the day, we're always going to have some discrepancy between the model and reality. And any safety guarantee that we have that is strictly based on the model can eventually be broken by reality. And the real world is really good at making fun of us and our best efforts. So one thing that we can do to make the system a bit more resilient is to have it actively monitor this reality gap between its model and its model-based guarantees, and what's actually going on in the world. And it turns out, and this is also important, that we don't need the model to be correct everywhere. We just need it to be sufficiently correct for our guarantees to apply in an intelligent way. So if we have the system plan incorporating the possibility that its model might be wrong, either now or in the future, then it automatically becomes much more robust to model error. And so this is uh, a general principle that can be exploited in different ways. And so what I'm going to show you now is how could we apply this to, in particular, the interaction between robots and people. Sure, you could take people and say, OK, the person has had a disturbance. I don't know what they're going to do. I'm going to do some worst case analysis where the person could go in any direction. Uh, and you would get something. Probably you would get overly conservative behavior. And it turns out that people, while they are extremely difficult to model accurately, actually follow very structured behavior a lot of the time. And cognitive science over the last few years has given us very powerful tools with which we can attempt to model with a reasonable degree of accuracy what people might or might not do in certain contexts. Now, the interaction between humans and robots is actually very tricky. And historically, there's been um, cases where it's been great to have the human and cases where it's been uh, quite um, tragic to have the human. So, it's, to me, interesting that both uh, of these accidents happened in 2009. There's one uh, that's usually known as the Miracle on the Hudson, and now it has a movie about it that some of you might have seen. It's called Sully. It's got Tom Hanks in it playing the, the main pilot. And ultimately, what happened was that the plane took off. Um, and there's something that we can talk a little bit more about uh, in, uh, maybe in the discussion after the talk. And something very unusual happened, which was that both of the engines got uh, taken down by bird strikes. Now, when we design an airplane, we often assume that it's extremely unlikely that both engines are going to get taken down. It turns out that if the birds, you know, if, if there's a sufficiently large group of birds, it's not impossible that both of your engines will get taken down, and this is exactly what happened. Thanks to there being a human pilot, here human judgment was the, the, key, uh, the key factor in uh, realizing that none of the nearby airports were safely reachable, but you could safely land in the river. And so this is what the pilot did, and everyone on board got saved. In the same year, unfortunately, there was a, a tragic case of the interaction between the human autom and the automation uh, leading to a crash. This was uh, an Air France, Air France flight that was flying from Brazil to France over the Atlantic. 
a fairly non-critical um, failure happened where the pitot tubes, which, uh, which measure the airspeed of the aircraft, uh, got frozen. And so the autopilot said, hey, I'm confused. I don't know what's happening. You take over. And then the pilots were very confused as to what was happening. The error message was extremely long. Uh, they thought that the plane might be stalling and that the speed was very low because the pitot tubes were frozen and therefore report, reporting very low speeds. So they actually um, started speeding up. They increased the thrust. The plane started climbing and eventually it entered uh, a stall. Uh, and then the stall warning went out, but the pilots weren't trusting the stall warning because at this point they weren't trusting the sensors. And eventually, three minutes after the original failure, the, air, the aircraft crashed. Uh, after what was initially a pretty trivial failure. If the pilots had just kept flying, uh, they would have reached uh, Paris safely. So here the, you know, the lesson is that we really have to be careful about how we design the automation uh, because it should really be accounting for how humans are going to interact with it. And this can often be very hard to model. Uh, I don't know if you have been following the case of the Boeing 330, uh, sorry, uh, 737 MAX. Uh, but it's been, it's been possibly the, the most, uh, you know, the, the biggest crisis that Boeing has gone through, at least in recent decades. And it has to do with precisely a safety system interacting in the wrong way with uh, the crew, take, making wrong decisions, but then making wrong assumptions about how the crew was going to respond to it. Uh, and it's you know already cost hundreds of lives. Fortunately, these planes are now grounded, so it's you know you can fly safely. Um, but it's really something that it's it's getting Boeing to really rethink how they're going about their safety analysis. So, anyway, I want to uh, show you this little example, this project that we ran, where we had this drone flying around the human, and what is at least one possible way in which you can reason about safety, accounting for how much you should trust your model of the of the human. So in the last few years, there's been, and in fact, in the last few decades, there's been um, a model that's been very successful and very useful of, uh, uh, for predicting human actions, which is what's called a noisy rational human model or a softmax model. Sometimes people call it the loose uh, choice rule because it was introduced in originally uh, by mathematical psychology and econometrics in the 50s. Uh, and it's really found a lot of useful applications in robotics and in artificial intelligence. And so what this model does is it says, well, I don't know exactly what the human is going to do at any given point in time. But what I can tell you is that there are certain things that are more likely than others. And how the robot reasons about the likelihood of different actions is by looking at how efficient each action seems to be for the certain uh, thing that the human might want to do. So the robot has some uh, utility-based model of uh, the human subjectives. And so it says, if it looks like the human, for example, is trying to walk to the door, and here we have theta parameterizing what the human might want to do, say that theta is leave the room, then the human is more likely to walk towards the door, a little less likely to walk, to walk indirectly towards the door, and very unlikely to walk in the opposite direction. So these models work fairly well, and the uh, robot, for example, can use them to navigate around the human. Now the problem comes when the human starts walking towards the door, and then suddenly something happens that was not part of the model at all in the first place. For example, a bee flies into the room. The robot probably can't even sense the presence of the bee. But if it could, it probably doesn't really understand the very peculiar relationship that people have with bees. <laughs> and therefore, this is a completely unexpected uh, you know, reaction of the human. And so what can we do given that people will sometimes do things that are unexpected? And they might violate all our assumptions about them. Well, we did a little experiment in the lab. It's complicated to do experiments with bees. So instead, we had a coffee spill. And then again, it wasn't even a real coffee spill. But here's the uh, figurative coffee spill. And we can see that when the human deviates, what is happening here, and I'll play this video again, is that the prediction that we had of the human going towards the goal is actually no longer accurate. So let me go back here a couple of steps. So you can see that even though the human is deviating because there's this coffee spill over there, the predictions still say, no, 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 the human's going to go straight to the goal. And eventually, the robot gets to this point where the trajectory is infeasible, and it doesn't know what to do. Now, of course, you could, you know, you could have something better than this. You could have a last resort, kind of like physics-based avoidance mechanism. But really, here, the point that we're trying to make is that the predictions are wrong, and the predictions being wrong can get you in trouble. In the best case, you will have to give the robot some sort of like emergency avoidance maneuver. And this, of course, works if it's a little drone. But if you're talking about a car on the highway, you can already be in a lot of trouble because you made the wrong prediction. So 
here the, the, the main principle that we're trying to, uh, to apply is, well, if the human is not following the model, it doesn't make sense to get mad at the human for not following the model. Uh, <laughs> But it makes sense to be a little bit more skeptical about the model that we have. And ultimately, by the way, this is true of any model. You can have a very simple kind of like model where you say, oh, the human might want to do one of three things, and this is how they go about it. Or you could have an extremely complex neural network-based model where you've observed a million humans in rooms like these, and you've generalized, and it works very well 99% of the time. But there's always this tail of the distribution that you have to be very careful with. Um, because there can always be something that you're not capturing. And in the case of humans, I probably don't need to convince you that this is true, that even if you train a neural network and it's a very good neural network with millions of neurons, it's not really going to capture everything that we do. So how do we go about uh, suspecting the model? Here we have the, the goal-driven behavior of the human, and we have some noisy rational model or some probabilistic model of what the human is going to do. But ultimately, bees, coffee spills, uh, any sort of uh, unmodeled intent or circumstances uh, can really uh, violate all of our assumptions. Well, it turns out that in uh, the models that reason about uh, actions probabilistically, there are usually parameters that are very helpful uh, in, in, in modulating the spread of the distribution, so to speak. In the case of noisy rationality, the entropy of the distribution is directly regulated by this beta parameter. So the higher the, the beta parameter, which is often called rationality, the rationality coefficient, I think rather incorrectly, because it's like you're blaming the human whenever they don't follow the model. You're being, just being irrational. Um, you can think of it as the degree of confidence that you should have in the model. So um, when beta is very high, you should expect uh, actions to probabilistically concentrate a lot around the optimal ones, whereas when beta is very low, you should expect things to be a little bit more noisy and the human to, with relatively high probability, take actions that are not actually that efficient for the goal because a human is actually doing something else that your goal is not really capturing very well. So what we do is instead of treating it as a fixed parameter, which is how it's usually treated, we say, okay, why don't we reason about this parameter beta under a Bayesian framework. So we think of it as a hidden state that can change over time, meaning that my model can work very well for a while and then suddenly degrade relatively quickly when the bee flies into the room. And uh, so whenever something happens that we're not expecting, the robot can now reason about the posterior distribution of this uh, confidence parameter given the prior uh, distribution that we had a moment ago and then how probable is that the human would take this action if uh, this uh, parameter had a high value versus if it had a low value. So we can actually do this update because it's a scalar parameter. We can actually do this even numerically very quickly over time, and we can do it in, uh, in real time. And so what happens is the robot very quickly updates its distribution about what the human is likely to do. So when the human is not acting according to your model, your distribution becomes much more cloudy and uncertain. And as a result, the robot becomes more conservative and avoids uh, getting into big trouble with the human. Uh, now, a question uh, that, is, uh, that is legitimate is can we, how do we you know, combine this probabilistic notion of how the human is going to move with some worst case analysis about, uh, for example, when we were talking about uh, the dynamics of the quad rotor before. Um, having some sort of bounded disturbance about the, you know, the physics of the robot are not exactly this particular model, but there's only going to be this much ground effect or delay in your rotor lag. Well, it turns out that a thing that you can do is you can actually put the two together and say, I'm going to reason about where the robot should be at a given point in time. But in practice, uh, and I'm going to reason about where the human might be uh, at a given point in time. In practice, the robot is not exactly going to be at this point, but I can actually compute using safety analysis a worst case tracking error bound for where the robot will be. Now, there's different ways you can do that. Uh, this uh, uh, reachability based model, there's actually uh, uh, another method that uh, Professor Pavon, I don't know, Marco, where are you? Oh, and some of his students have been working on, uh, which also gives you some, some bounce on the, on the amount of error that you're going to have when you track. If you use any of these methods, what you can now do is you can say, well, okay, the robot can be in any of these locations over time. Let me project this set onto the probability distribution of where the human might be over time. And when I integrate the amount of probability mass that I have inside of this set, that is essentially the probability of crashing into the human, given the worst case uh, tracking errors that I could have uh, for the physical motion of the, of the vehicle. And when you combine these two techniques, it turns out that you can actually provide some real-time assurances about 
uh, how likely the quad rotor is going to be to stay clear of the human whenever you are um, uh, trying to physically track these trajectories. And so what's good about this is that if the human starts behaving in a strange way, this distribution will automatically become much more blurry. And so your automatic computation of these trajectories will automatically become more conservative. So here's a little example. We have the human moving around like this. this. In this case, we're going to keep confidence fixed. So we're not actually reasoning about how well the model is performing. You can see that the human goes to the first known goal. Everything's fine. Starts moving to the second known goal, and the model is able to make sense of it. And now the human starts moving in a, to a third goal that we have no idea about. And you can see that the predictions are ridiculous. They're just not doing anything useful. The robot is convinced that the human is going to turn around immediately and start going to this goal because it doesn't realize that the human is no longer following the model in a reasonable way. Now, this is a relatively simple model. But even if you had a more complex model, ultimately, this thing is qualitatively what is going to happen. Your model will make wrong predictions. And still, those predictions, even if they are probabilistic, will be overly confident because you're not reasoning about whether or not you should trust your model. Instead, with the Bayesian confidence uh, method that we're using here, you'll see a very similar behavior for as long as the human is going to one of the known goals. But as soon as the human starts uh, moving to the third goal, and this is in fact the same recorded trajectory of the human, you can see that suddenly you have a much more uh, um, uncertain prediction. And so the robot decides to take a more conservative path so that even though the human is doing strange things that the model doesn't understand, there won't be a collision. So you're kind of modulating the amount of conservative, uh, conservativeness that you need your robot to exercise based on how uh, confused it is about what the human is doing. OK, very good. I'll just show you a final video of the, of the end result. This was actually shot by Wired, uh, who are much better than us at making cool videos. So I just wanted uh, to show you, because it's a very nice. You can see exactly what's happening. As soon as Andrea starts deviating from the behavior that you can expect, you see that the robot is already maneuvering to stay clear of her and indeed gets out of the way and avoids collisions, even though it doesn't exactly know what she's going to do. It's becoming more conservative the second it realizes that its model is not really being very good at predicting. All right. But there's probably one, I don't know why I have this video twice. There's probably one, uh, you know, there's kind of like an elephant in the room in this whole uh, analysis that we're doing. And some of you might be thinking about it, which is, OK, but what about interaction? The human here appears to just be doing its thing, her thing, and the robot is actually getting in the way. Isn't that going to affect what the human does? And indeed, this is a very important question uh, that we're kind of overlooking in that, in that work. Um, and it's extremely important in things like autonomous driving and you know, robots in the home, which is, well, uh, the robot is thinking about what the human is going to do, but the human is also thinking about what the robot is going to do. Therefore, the model of the robot should really have a, you know, the, a, a little bubble inside there where the human is thinking back about what the robot is doing. And this is also true of the, you know, of the human's model of the robot. <laughs> So now this kind of gets you into this sort of infinite regress where the human is thinking about what the robot think that is, you know, that is thinking the robot's going to think it's thinking. And um, unfortunately, this becomes very intractable very quickly. And uh, even you know, the companies deploying self-driving car systems are trying to uh, eschew this kind of treatment as much as possible. But what you can see is that when you just try to assume that people are doing their thing, uh, you can become way, way too conservative. And so this is a video. I'll play it again. It came out last year, some person on Twitter. Uh, this is the, the Waymo vehicle trying to merge onto a highway that, sure, has some traffic, but it's not terrible. Uh, and it just can't find an opening because it's you know, convinced that nobody is going to let it go and eventually it merges off. Obviously, in order to be able to drive competently, you need to be actively reasoning about how people are going to respond to you. And this is how all of us, uh, who at least have a driver's license, uh, reason when we're, when we're driving, right? So we really need these systems to be able to do this competently, but also without being overly uh, aggressive and just saying, like, well, I'm just going to do it, and you have to uh, let me go. So um, coordination here is ultimately very important. By the way, people are much better at coordination than we typically realize. There's a little experiment that I like to run, um, because it's actually, at least, it surprised me a lot when somebody uh, told me this the first time. So we're going to play a very quick game. Uh, which is basically uh, heads or tails, but we're actually not playing against each other. We're playing all together. So the objective is to say the same thing as everybody else. So basically, I'm going to count to three. And after three, we're all going to say either heads or tails. And uh, we win if everybody says the same thing. 
and we lose if you know, people start saying different things. Does that make sense? And we can't talk to each other, no winking, no nothing, okay? So we're going to go after three, I'm gonna say one, two, three, and the uh is gonna be the answer, okay? All ready? All right, let's do it. One, two, three, heads. Okay, 95% heads, something like that? Okay, very good. So what happens here is that you're, you know, we don't have time to get into the, the whole details, but every person is making you know, some quick inference about, are people slightly more likely to say one thing than the other? Okay, maybe heads. Wait, if I'm thinking this and everyone is thinking this, then we're totally all going to say heads. Okay, let's say heads. So this is very subtle, and it's very difficult for robots to reason about it, but still this kind of thing plays an important part every time we're negotiating an intersection. So. One of the things that I've been trying to look at is can we use game theory to try to reason about this sort of uh, interplay between what I think you're going to do and what I'm going to do based on what you're trying to make me do, et cetera. Um, it turns out that there are game theoretic tools that you can apply without you know, things blowing up and becoming intractable. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and so one of, the, one of the things that you can do is you can have this tactical level at which you're reasoning about trajectories and you can have a relatively simple interaction model uh, where, for example, you assume that their human is going to respond to what you do, uh, but they're not necessarily also strategically trying to affect what you're doing. And that's fine over a short horizon of about half a second. So, you know, the typical trajectory optimizers tend to re uh, reason in this, this kind of level. But if you're trying to plan a complex maneuver, like, an, you know, crossing an intersection or an overtaking maneuver or reasoning about who goes first before overtaking a truck, um, you really need to reason on a longer horizon, say five or ten seconds. And so when, when, you're using, when you're reasoning over that kind of horizon, it actually becomes very relevant to think about how uh, we're going to strategically influence each other. And so for that, you need to use something uh, that is more coupled, where your decisions and the decisions of others are coupled, and that is dynamic game theory. And so what we uh, do to keep things tractable in this case is we say, okay, let's do a hierarchical analysis where we use the full dynamical model here with a simplified interaction model, and then at a high level, we use a simplified dynamical model where we don't have all the, you know, all the details of the tire in contact with the ground and whatnot, but instead we're going to have a more uh, accurate interaction model between the automation and the human. Again, using some human model that might be flawed. And so the way this works for the strategic planner, to give you a very uh, quick picture, you don't need to look at the algorithm too much, is we consider we discretize the world into a number of states and we consider how much the human and the robot like each of these states. The robot here is in yellow. And we say, okay, uh, if we go one step back in time and you consider each of these states, for example, this one, uh, the robot has a bunch of different actions that it can take. And based on the action that it takes, the human will be more or less happy with uh, the situation and will be more or less happy to take different actions. So you're now reasoning probabilistically as before about how the human might respond to each of the possible actions that you could take. And so you say, well, I actually don't like this very much. Let me try a different action and see how the human might respond probabilistically. And by doing this, you determine the best action that the robot should take at each uh, particular state at each point in time. And you can continue doing this for all the states and then you can do this uh, in backward time. It turns out that this row over here can be done simultaneously so you can actually exploit massively parallel architectures so that you can actually do this whole computation very quickly for a time horizon. And because you have a relatively simplified model of the world, um, you can actually have this thing compute a value function for you, which is based on the game theoretic interaction. And what you can do now is you say, okay, here's my trajectory optimization uh, that I'm using with my standard uh, method that maybe Google or uh, Waymo or uh, uh, Uber are utilizing in their, in their uh, planning. So here are my trajectories and here are the human trajectories. And what you do now is you add a final value, a terminal value term, terminal uh, reward, that captures the strategic value. So this is similar to what you do if you're playing a game of chess and you do some tree exploration and then ultimately you use a heuristic to determine what you think is going to happen from now on. And so it turns out that by doing this, you get uh, an augmented uh, version of the trajectory optimization where you're actually saying, well, where do I want to end up at the end of my half second horizon? Where is the interaction going to be more beneficial to me? Using a model of this interaction that is accounting for the strategic influence between the two players. And it turns out that this actually works uh, fairly well, and I want to show you a couple of examples. Uh, so in the first case here, we have an overtaking maneuver, 
And what you're seeing over here is uh, you know, a color coding of the values that the robot sees relative to the human. So blue is high and red is low. Excuse me, and as you, as you can see, when the robot approaches the human, there's a, there's a tiny blue stain over here that is actually going to start growing. And the reason that it, that it is there and that it's growing is that the robot knows that there's some, it has some ability to push the human, to influence the human, to incentivize the lane change. So in the right case, the human changes lane. In the left case, she doesn't. Uh, and what you can see is that there's a gradient of value pulling the robot, sucking the robot into the maneuver. Because even though it's only planning with a short time horizon, which is uh, what you can see here with the little transparent cars, I'll play this video again, um, the value is actually already giving you, uh, the, value, the value function here shown in, in, in colors, it's already giving you information about how the interaction is going to go when you go forward. So here you actually make the, the human move and then the value extends over here. Here you just switch because you have this blue carpet that's pulling you effectively like a potential field um, into the overtaking maneuver. So it's a nice and tractable way of reasoning with a longer horizon, but also doing this accounting for the interaction. Now interestingly, I don't have a video for this, as the confidence that you have on the human goes down, so say that you're doing something like what we were doing before, and you're saying, hey, the human is acting in a strange way and is wiggling around. When the confidence goes down, the human becomes more likely to do anything that is not following your model. And then this value actually becomes much less uh, pronounced. And in fact, it gets to the point where it becomes unsafe to attempt an overtaking maneuver. And the robot will actually stay back and avoid getting close to the human because it doesn't understand what the human is going to do. So that's sort of the kind of behavior that you would uh, intuitively expect. Now, another example that we really wanted to, to cover, and with this I'm almost out of time, was what happens when you're getting to this typical situation where you're going to overtake a truck, and then out of the corner of your eye you catch somebody who is accelerating on the other lane, and they're about to try to cut, cut you off right the second before you overtake the truck. Right? This is probably something that's happened to many of us at some point in time. Uh, well, this is a very game theoretic kind of situation, right? You sort of feel the, the game theoretic pressure here in the test where you're like, well, okay, I can accelerate and cut the other person off and make it clear that they can't go, or I can decelerate and let them go with a little bit of margin, or I can keep doing what I'm doing and maintain speed, but then they're probably still going to go for it and it's probably not going to be safe. So uh, it turns out that when you throw this kind of analysis uh, in this case, you'll see that the white car here decides to slow down and let the yellow car go. In this case, it actually starts accelerating and decides that it's not going to let the yellow car go. And this basically changes with the initial conditions depending on who's going faster and how far away you are from the, from the truck. But it's interesting that basically these two kinds of strategies do in fact emerge uh, where the, in this case, the white car is really trying to affect the um, behavior of the, of the aggressive car, uh, whether or not it overtakes. Anyway, so I wanted to end with a quick reflection about, you know, we've been talking about robotic systems, but the truth is that AI systems are, you know, more and more pervasive and not only in the form of uh, robots, but also in the form of a lot of complex uh, platforms that we're interacting with every day and that usually have this very simple model where they assume that this is us and this is them and all they're doing is they're providing services once as a one-time thing. Uh, and they're really failing to acknowledge that there is a closed loop dynamic between us and the system. Um, and you know, every time you give a recommendation, this affects the opinions that the person has. It affects a new input that the person uh, gives you. And every time you give them you know, recommendations, sometimes false positives, negatives, or you favor a certain kind of content over other kind of content, this really affects, uh, it, it changes uh, the way the person uh, it's thinking of the way the person is interacting with the model, uh, sorry, with the automation, which in, turns, in turn affects the model that the automation is forming of the person. And so there, I think there are some important and kind of overlooked effects, uh, at least from the technical point of view. Um, and people are starting to talk about this in the news, about social polarization through social media, et cetera. But I really think that there's, you know, here there's an opportunity to try to analyze how this all works. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, an important thing to realize is that this becomes very intractable very quickly. Now, the effects that this thing is having on every human are actually also having effects globally on you know, political polarization, social inequality. And so it's very hard to do, but I really think that we should make an effort to reason about um, the close loop between automation systems, AI systems, and people. Um, 
and really trying to reason about what are the what are the consequences of these interactions and to what extent we can try to design systems that will prevent certain kinds of damage that is uh, undesired. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a couple of uh, slides that I had in the, in the, at the very end. Um, I do want to say that a couple of assumptions that break, uh, that break uh, a lot are assumptions made by some companies uh, commercializing uh, semi-automated vehicles. For example, the assumption that the person will take over whenever the system makes a mistake, and that the person will be able to take over in less than a second to save their own lives. This is something that sometimes is true, like this person here who grabs the wheel right before the car autonomously drives into the vehicle in the oncoming lane. Uh, but sometimes it's not true, and there have been uh, accidents precisely due to this failure to acknowledge uh, that the interaction between the human and the, and the robot is simply not that easy and not that ideal. And you know, in the case of the MCAS system, I really think that Boeing is learning the lesson the hard way. Uh, that it's not okay to just assume that the pilot will immediately take over, especially when, like in their case, they didn't even uh, educate the pilots about the existence of this system in the first place. Um, so with that, um, you know, a quick uh, final reflection. I think we can make these robotic and AI systems more reliable in the future. Um, I think that uh, some things we can do is actively reason about how we can uphold these assurances and these guarantees, um, monitoring the validity of the assumptions that we make in light, the observed, in light of the observed data, and remaining humble, especially when predicting human behavior and trying to uh, even figure out what human values are and what humans want the automation system to do, uh, which is, I think, uh, relevant to discussing things like you know, uh, social media, automation, et cetera. Um, and finally, I think that one of the reasons that this kind of safety analysis is very useful and can be useful going forward is that it really helps us think hard and flesh out what are the assumptions that we're making and what are the conditions under which we think it's acceptable for a system to fail. Uh, maybe society accepts that if both engines get taken down by birds at the same time, the plane might go down, and maybe that is just OK. That I'm not sure we accept, but one thing that we certainly accept is that if both pilots on a plane have a heart attack at exactly the same time, then the system's going to go down. And we get on planes every, not every day, but like, you know, pretty, pretty often, many of us, and we're kind of implicitly accepting that if both pilots die or become incapacitated at the same time, we might really be in trouble. We just think that this is extremely unlikely, and that if this were to happen, you know, we, we sort of make peace with the fact that, that this is uh, a possible failure now. So fleshing out what are these assumptions, what are the conditions under which a system might fail, I think can be extremely useful in terms of deploying automation systems that even if they're not perfect, are highly reliable when they're supposed to be reliable. I'd much rather uh, get in a car that tells me this car is going to drive uh, safely unless uh, uh, you know, it gets attacked at the same time by the person to the right, the person to the left, and the person in front, and it doesn't have a way out, than just getting in a car that says, uh, this car is safe 99.9% .9 of the time, period. Right? So I mean, maybe something to think about when it comes to designing these kinds of systems. I think that if we get these things right, we will be able to have a future in which all of our automated systems will be so trustworthy that we'll be perfectly OK with letting our children go outside and play with them. But really, in order to get uh, from here to that future, we should very much mind the gap. So with that, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Questions, thoughts, complaints. Yes? When you show that the drone can adapt its model of what the human can do when he see that he's not following his prediction, mm -hmm. uh, he then just draw like an uncertainty region around the human. And at which point can he recompute a predictive model of what he will do? Right. Does he stay in this uh, uncertain model? Or Right, so that's a very, that is a, a very good question. And in fact, what I would argue is that you should always be recomputing your model of what the human is going to do. Uh, but also know that this is not sufficient, because when you're recomputing the model of what the human is going to do, you're going to do this within some space of possible models, right? And the problem is that this space of models is fundamentally what might not contain reality. And so you might improve the model, but that model might still not be able to capture mm -hmm. 
what the human is actually doing and what the human is really going to do. So in fact, what happens is you always have an uncertainty region around the human. All you're doing with this, with this uh, uh, adaptation, if you will, is you're changing the shape of that uncertainty. But even when the human is behaving pretty accurately according to your model, you do have an uncertainty re region around your human. And it should always be that way. I think the, the most dangerous thing that a robot or an automated system can ever do is to have a perfectly clear-cut prediction of what the human is going to do. Right? That, can, that is always going to end up uh, tragically sooner or later. <laughs>